Good morning and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. This feels like kind of the morning after the hangover from uh, a truly awful night for Democrats. I, I don't know that you can deny uh, the warning signals that came out of Virginia and in some ways even worse out of New Jersey. I, I think that the Democratic governor in New Jersey is going to pull this out, uh, although it should not have been this close. Keep in mind that Joe Biden won Virginia by 10 points, but he won New Jersey by 16 points. And nobody thought that New Jersey was going to be close at all. I mean, at all. Uh, the polls would suggest that the incumbent Democrat was going to cruise to reelection by a landslide. So there really wasn't that much attention. So as, as the night went on last night, people began to realize, wow, this thing is actually close. This this could happen. And I think this gives you an indication of how bad the political environment is for Democrats across the board going into the midterm election. So joining me to parse all of this out is our colleague, Mona Charon, a resident of the state of Virginia. So uh, interesting night for you last night, huh? Well, it was, um, although I have to say that people who have been uh, the members of the Bulwark Plus uh, who watch our live streams were not a bit surprised uh, because uh, lots of us, you, JBL, mm -hmm. Sarah, Tim, me, we've all been saying that this was coming. Um, yeah. And we I, have I, been dismissed, right? Mm, it's like, oh, you guys, you're just you're just I, these never Trump Republicans and you don't know the base. Don't need you people. Yeah, yeah. Don't need you people. Uh, that's one big lesson from last night that I really pray the Democrats get. But but Charlie, I don't I'm, I don't know that they will get the right lesson. I think there's a lot of commentary out there this morning saying you know, uh, McAuliffe, he was so moderate and, and unexciting to the base. And the, that's what we really need. We need the base to be enthusiastic. And that means more progressive. Um, <laughs> OK, yeah. No, I, I if, if, if you think that the problem in Virginia was you didn't run a an AOC Bernie progressive, more full throated progressive than I thought, then I think you're drawing the completely wrong um, conclusion from all of this. But but let's start. Let's start here. Um, I'm, actually, I'm gonna, I want to start with what's been going on in your basement, because I think that that's important to talk about. But <laughs> this 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 was Glenn Youngkin last night um, during his acceptance speech and not surprisingly spent a good deal of time talking about education and touched on a number of, uh, of themes that proved to be quite potent uh, in the election yesterday. Here's Glenn Youngkin. We're going to press forward with a curriculum that includes listening to parents' input, a curriculum Ouch. that allows our children to run as fast as they can, teaching them how to think, yeah. enabling their dreams to soar. Friends, we are going to reestablish excellence in our schools. I, I think they were chanting, let's go, Brandon. No, I didn't. <laughs> well, something about the schools. Fight but for I, schools. Okay, yeah. so so he didn't, uh, in, in that sound bite, we don't hear him talking about CRT, but he did hit two other things that obviously uh, worked for him. Uh, number one, listening to parents after that gaffe from McAuliffe that we, we don't want parents having any say in schools. And emphasizing his support for excellence. Uh, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that, because this is an issue that I think is potentially quite deadly for Democrats. The the uh, in in New York, you have the you had the the outgoing mayor eliminating the gifted and talented programs or attempting to. Is is that what this is? This is part oh, of the Charlie. of the fight. Yeah, I am so glad you brought yeah, that up yeah. because, okay, so first of all, yes, the outgoing, very progressive mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, announced as one of his final acts as mayor that he was eliminating the entire gifted and talented program in the city of New York. And the uh, incoming mayor, Eric Adams, made an immediate comment. This was before he was the mayor. He was the nominee at, the, at that point saying, if elected, he would reverse that decision. Okay. So that is uh, very, very interesting because Eric Adams uh, is the kind of Democrat that can win because he is not the captive of the left. And, you know, he was against the defund the police, former police officer himself and so on. Um, in Northern Virginia, where I live, absolutely one of the issues is this uh, 
perceived war on excellence. Look, one Mm -hmm. of the ways, uh, there's no question that some opposition to the teaching of CRT is based in racism. No question. But it isn't all of it. And the left errs when they mistake what they're seeing as just racism. It's not that simple. One of the things that's happening is around the country, and it certainly did happen in Northern Virginia, is that um, you get the the kind of teaching that David Brooks mentioned in his column. It's not CRT, no, but it teaches things uh, that are sort of that Ibram X. Kendi or Robin DiAngelo's inflected philosophy, you know, sort of the ideas that, for example, individuality or excellence are just, you know, holdovers of the white patriarchy. There was a professor, I think, at Wellesley who was explaining that rationality is a, a heteronormative white patriarchal concept. And uh, in Northern Virginia, all right, let's bring this down to to reality here, right? In Northern Virginia, there is a very famous public school called Thomas Jefferson. It's a magnet school that is focused on STEM subjects. It does everything, but it's focused on STEM subjects. It has an entrance exam, and it is rated as one of the top high schools in the country, the top public high school in the country. Very competitive to get in. It has trended over recent years, about 70% Asian. Okay. Mm-hmm. And one of the moves that, that uh, happened under the current um, uh, democratic uh, administration is that they changed the admission standards for TJ to downplay the, the testing and um, make it more inclusive and make sure that more people from different backgrounds mm-hmm. were accepted. There is a lot of resistance to that. And frankly, it's offensive because it is it 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 wars against the idea of merit. You know, I mean it isn't it, it TJ is not a redoubt of whites. <laughs> it was a place that was populated in recent years almost, you know, very dominantly by kids from places like Pakistan and China and, uh, you know, elsewhere. So whose parents were obviously. Um, And, uh, and, and that strikes a lot of people that that movement to level everything and to lower standards in the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that is getting pushed back and rightfully so. Yeah, that will be a dagger in some of the upscale uh, college-educated suburbs that uh, Democrats have increasingly counted on. Um, And I think what we found yesterday is that they were just renting those votes. And this is one of the issues that I think hurt them badly. You know, listening to you talk about this, uh, I'm having this flashback because uh, you and I, I think we're probably both writing about this back in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote a book called Dumbing Down Our Kids, which was really the attack on excellence and standards in the schools. And uh, there were all kinds of fads within the educational establishment that that looked down on the idea of, you know, advanced courses or relying on on test scores uh, or uh, there was a push to abolish grades, um, to abolish homework. And and this this has been a push pull that's been going on for decades. Why do you think it suddenly burst out? to become this huge wedge issue? Because it's been around for a very, very long time. Well, um, part of it is um, that there were a lot of moves. uh, By the way, I just want to, just for the record, I just want to say one of the changes that they made to the admissions requirements at TJ that I think is great is that they they dropped the uh, fee. They're Mm -hmm. no, no longer a $100 fee. And that's great. That is a broadening the base kind of move. Great. But um, I do think that in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, um, there was a huge push in lots of institutions around the country and in uh, liberal dominated ones, progressive dominated ones more than others. And sometimes that includes school systems to do something to to show solidarity, to, um, uh, you know, to to make Mm -hmm. moves in the direction of um, racial justice. And you know, that is great and it should be applauded and it's definitely necessary and important. And we've talked a lot about that. Um, but when it begins to push up against the idea of excellence, mm, 
then you're you're getting into a dangerous area. See, I think that this is the real wedge issue, and I think it's been under the under the radar because everybody's been focused on the the critical race theory. I I think that this push um, has created much more anxiety among parents who are thinking, is my kid not going to be receiving uh, the best uh, education? Uh, you know, is, is the school not going to be uh, serving the best and the brightest? Might, might my child be held back in the name of some abstract equity? Um, and, and what does that mean for their ability to get into school, uh, to get into the good schools, et cetera, which are highly competitive? So th this I, I, I hesitate to use the, the, the word ramming speed, but I think one of the reasons why this, this broke out was exactly that the, the, these trends had always been there, but they were being pushed somewhat more aggressively. Now, having said that, let me take a deep breath here because I know the backlash we're going to get. Oh, yeah. And I, and I talk about this in, in the piece that I wrote for Politico magazine last night. You know, d Democrats do need to ask themselves some hard questions. I mean, after what happened last night, they really need to ask themselves, given what a clown car Republicans have turned themselves into, why uh, can't they beat these guys? Why are they losing to this absurd party that has become more authoritarian, anti-democratic, more extreme on all of these issues? And in part, I think it's because they don't listen to themselves. I don't think they mm -hmm. realize the extent to which they are speaking a different language than many of the voters they need to win. And this would be one of them. And there's this term, it's kind of wonky, uh, you know, asymmetrical polarization, mm -hmm. which is which is the theory that the, all the culture wars and all the polarization is solely the result of, of conservatives who have become much more conservative. And it's not us. And if you suggest that people on the left have contributed in any way, this is both siderism. But yeah. the reality is, and there have been, if you look at the Pew surveys over the years, look, Democrats have moved further to the left than I think they are willing to acknowledge sometimes. Now, it's not, I don't, I'm not trying to draw a moral equivalence. It doesn't mean it's 50, 50, whatever it is though, uh, the point to the, to the point where, um, you know, the, the Democrats and particularly the elite college educated Democrats who shape the messaging are no longer speaking the language of rural voters, um, working class voters, black working class voters, Hispanic working class voters. And the problem is that with this educational polarization, yes, they have been doing better among college educated white people, but there are not enough of them to win elections. There are yeah. far more non-college educated voters out there. And even though Democrats have been picking up with college educated voters, they have been losing ground rather dramatically with non-college educated voters. And I don't know what they're doing to address that. And and and, and so I guess uh, in, in the context of this, this attack on quote unquote excellence in schools then really undermines the one thing that, that they have been succeeding at, which is the college educated voters who are going to go, not with my kids, you're not. Yeah. So let's just say as a thought experiment that the left is right, that you know, we really should be a much more progressive mm -hmm. country. We should have much more of a, of a progressive approach in our schools, in our, in our companies, in our government. We should have a government that's much larger. Let's say they're right about all of that. Okay. Um, they have to live in the real world and recognize that the Republican Party at this point is, as you said in your in your uh, piece, you know, is the province of people like Lauren Boebert and and uh, Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene and of course Donald Trump at the top. They have to beat those people. They have to make sure those people do not get into power. Right. And so let's just say they're right about their whole agenda. They have to tailor it. They have to cut back and say, you know what? It'd be great to have all these things, but we we have to win elections because the country is at stake. So we have to trim our sails a little bit, go, you know, tack to the middle. Yes, to the middle. Be acceptable to the voters who, yeah, they turned out in huge numbers uh, for Biden because they did want to get rid of Trump. Um, but they are not, as you said, they're only being rented. They have not become progressive Democrats. They need to be made to feel comfortable in the party they voted for last time. And, they, and it, obviously the message of yesterday is they're not. They're getting really scared. And that's such a bad sign. 
and look, and and that, and you're seeing that across the board in in Virginia and and in New Jersey as well, and in Minneapolis. But, Okay, well, I th- there are so many fascinating results. Uh, Minneapolis voted overwhelmingly against a basically a defund the police thing. I, I understand that that's a little bit more complicated. It would abolish the police department, replace it with the public safety department. Uh, voters said no. In Seattle, a moderate uh, candidate for mayor won easily against the progressive candidate who had been, you know, talking about defunding the police. A Republican one for city attorney in the city of Seattle. I mean, think about that for a moment. Right, right. And in Buffalo, New York, I know you've been following this This one. is the best. Okay, <sighs> this, this is the best. So what happens is they, a Democratic Socialist wins the Democratic primary, and she is uh, poised to become the first Socialist mayor of a major city in decades, and she is the only candidate on the ballot. There's no Republican. So- <laughs> The Democratic Socialist is the only candidate on the ballot, but the incumbent mayor, the one she'd beaten in the primary, who'd been asleep apparently, decides <laughs> to launch a write-in campaign. Do you know how hard a write-in campaign is? Exactly. I mean, he beats her 59-41. Right. So s- socialists and the defund the police people just were annihilated in very, very liberal progressive areas. So it was quite a night. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I wonder though, Charlie, I mean, sometimes people are just so inside their own little bubbles. Will they recognize the the situation and will they, will they, uh, you know, if Bill Clinton were president, he would get the message and he would say, okay, I get it. I I've got it. I've got it. Switch tax. And I just don't know if these people are capable of it. Well, uh, and and again, part of this, and uh, and and I'm 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 not original about this. This is David Shore has written about this. Um, others have written about it. The, the way in which the the Democratic Party is increasingly dominated by a group of you know white, highly educated el- elites who do shape the messaging, and they are to the left of the Democratic uh, electorate on almost every issue. In fact, what's interesting is they are to the left of black and Hispanic Democrats. Absolutely. And so this is one of those things they keep, you know, scratching their heads. Why are we losing ground with people? That we, I mean, we just assumed that, you know, demographics was our, you know, was our friend. And, uh, and you're seeing that erosion continuing. OK, so let's go back to CRT. Wait, wait, can um, I, before yeah, we yeah, do, sure, can please. I just make yeah, one other yeah. point about um, the electorate? Because I want to repeat a point that uh, JVL made last night on our live stream that I thought was really shrewd. He he points to the unbelievable margins in the rural areas mm-hmm. for the Republicans last night. And and he said, you know, the Democrats have, have decided, OK, we don't have rural voters, so we're not even going to make any effort to win them over. It's already right. really bad. How bad can it get? And the answer is it can get worse. So the the rural voters went for Yunkin in higher margins than they went for, went Trump, for Trump in 2020. Yeah. Okay. So the answer is, yeah, it can get worse. And if enough of those rural voters go, you know, are, are, are if they're going for Republicans in those kinds of margins, 80, 20 in some counties, then you know, the Democrats can't make it up in the cities. Well, and, 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 and the fact that the Democrats really didn't compete for those votes is, is really an indictment. Tim has a great piece about that up in the bulwark today. The other lesson I, I think, and I'm, I'm, this is a lot of this is very, very frustrating because I mean, how many, how many debates or panels have you been on where people say there are no swing voters anymore? Oh my there God. Are no, it's all, yeah. it's all, it's all, it's all about the base. So what you have to yeah. do is ignore the swing voters and just feed red meat to your base. I, I hear this all the time. Uh, the Virginia results and the New Jersey results ought to make it very clear that there are swing voters and they did swing last night. There are persuadable voters. There are voters who voted for Joe Biden and then voted for Republicans for governor. They exist. And any politics that doesn't acknowledge that, I think, is uh, is, is doomed to failure. So when, when I want and to get back to And in a closely this, divided country, they're very everything. Close. Well, like 70, I mean, really, Trump was defeated by, you know, what, a, you know, a couple, you know, was it 70,000 votes or, or so? It's it's in the, the tens of thousands of votes when you in look at states, the Electoral right. College. So- on the critical race theory issue, one of the problems that I'm seeing today is 
the, and maybe this is just social media, maybe it's just cable TV. It's kind of this almost knee jerk reaction that the reason that Democrats lost yesterday uh, was because the voters are racist. They're all racist. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, the CRT thing was all about racial dog whistles. And, and, and there's, there's, look, um, there's always partial truth to that. And, and I do think that it was demagogic what Youngkin did with critical race theory. I think it was mm -hmm. misleading. I think it mm -hmm. was cynical. I think, you know, campaigning against Toni Morrison's Pulitzer Prize winning book was, <laughs> was, you know, was, 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 was deplorable. On the other hand, this, this almost reflexive attack on the voters strikes me as also self-defeating. Uh, going back to the, the the point about how Democrats aren't contesting rural voters. Um, mm -hmm. Well, if, if your reaction to, you know, the loss is to double down on accusing them of white supremacy and being racist bigots, well, how is that going to work out for you? Yeah. How is How will that actually turn things around? So CRT was an issue. There's no question about it. There's a little bit of, there, there's not a little bit, there's a lot of a white backlash here. But it strikes me as reductive and a little bit lazy to attribute all of the problems simply to racism, especially when these are the same voters that voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden just two years ago. Yeah. And, you know, the, I'm sorry, one uh, year ago. One year ago. One, <laughs> one year ago. Exactly. One year exactly. ago. Um, you know, one of the ways, I mean, Youngkin, uh, sorry, uh, McAuliffe was a terrible candidate. Yeah. Um, he was, he just was out of sync with what the issues were this time around. Uh, he never talked about inflation, for example, whereas Youngkin did. Um, and, and on this education question, when it was presented to him, he said there was no issue. It was simply made up by Youngkin and Trump and the Republicans, this whole matter of uh, the schools. And the fact is, if he had just given a slightly more subtle response, if he had said, look, we have to teach our history in a way that is truthful. We have to be, we have to cope with the fact yep. of slavery and, 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 and Jim Crow and lynchings and all of it. But we also have to focus on how much, how far we've come and how much progress we've made. And this is a great country and people still want to come here, et cetera. If he had just done that, honestly, he could have diffused a lot of it. But by insisting that it was all made up, just a big lie, you know, that's very alienating. And I think Democrats need to study this carefully and need to calibrate how they talk about these things. As you say, continuing to accuse your voters of racism is a dead end and uh, they will be slaughtered. And by the way, it's, it's as you and I keep saying, I mean, this is about the third time in this podcast yeah. that we've said it, but yes, there's racism out there, but it is not the dominant view of the voters. It just, that's just wrong. No, and 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 again, we, you know, we we do have these voters who voted for Obama, Obama, Trump. Now, that's right. I, I, I I think that's a deplorable choice on their part, but to imply that that the vote was solely the result of racism requires a lot of a lot of logical pretzeling. I I just I just think that it's one of those those moments where the resistance is so strong to introspection. And that's, that's the real danger. I mean, I think very early in the, in the podcast, you asked the question, you know, will Republican, I mean, will Democrats recognize this as a wake up call? Will they make the proper adjustments? And you were skeptical about it. I mean, I'm looking at, you know, social media and, you know, the, the resistance to actual, you know, you know, coming to grips with the fact that, Hey, you're not, you've lost touch with key constituents. You've forgotten how to talk to these people. There's a vibe you're giving off that is absolutely toxic. And, absolutely. and, 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 and they're not willing to see that. Well, okay. many of them but, are. But yeah. can I just make, though, a quick point in response? I, I agree with everything you just said, yeah. obviously. Can I make a quick point, though, in response to the um, Ross Douthat tweet and others that uh, last night that, you know, Young, Youngkin should really consider running for president and this is part of the uh, theme that we have seen um, in some precincts on the right, people saying we need to get behind somebody who is not Trump, anybody, you know, DeSantis uh, was one suggestion, and now Yunkin. So I just want to game out a little bit, you know, because as JVL pointed out, 
Youngkin was able to become the nominee because he did not have to face a primary. He didn't have to face the Republican primary. It was a weird sort of convention system that Dang they yeah. did. And yeah, and he, and so that's, that's one thing. But so imagine that he that does. That is hugely important. Hugely important. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hugely important, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, and it was also ranked choice voting. I mean, the, the party in Virginia really wanted to avoid Amanda Chase, who called herself um, Trump in heels. Okay, fine. Um, that's hard to replicate around the country. But but let's just play out for a second what would happen if Youngkin did run. Let's say even uh, that Trump was not running. Obviously, if Trump were running, nobody can beat him. But let's say he weren't. The very first thing that Republican voters would demand of Youngkin is that he be explicit about the steal of 2020. Not that he dance around it, not that he sort of not answer, as he did in the Virginia race, but there, he's going to have to be explicit. And when he's explicit about it, he's contributing. He then becomes almost as bad uh, as Trump because of the undermining of confidence in our, in our system. So, I mean, I, I guess I guess the question is, where do you come down on on the question of Trump's role in this campaign? I mean, there are people who would argue that that in some ways this was a repudiation of Trumpism, that Young can distance himself from Donald Trump. Uh, they didn't have the rallies with him so that the, what you're seeing is uh, evidence that a non-Trumpian mainstream Republican can still win these elections. On the other hand. Um, you look at the numbers and say, look, Do Donald Trump and, and Trumpism clearly supercharged the turnout in some areas of the state, uh, you know, particularly the rural areas in southern Virginia. And without Donald Trump, you wouldn't have that kind of transformation of, of the electorate. So yeah. where do you come down on Trump, the importance of Trump, the influence of Trump in this election? Was, is this a post-Trump uh, election or another indication of how potent he is as a, as a force for the Republicans? So it's, it's sort of neither. I would say this was a case where this particular candidate was able to thread the needle yeah. in a way that is going to be awfully hard for others to do. Uh, he was able to, during the primary, not say that Joe Biden was the lawfully elected president uh, and avoid the issue only after he achieved the nomination. Did he say that, yes, Biden was the uh, legitimate president or words to that effect? Um, and he was able to keep Trump at arm's length for some reason for, you know, God only knows why. But Trump got smart and didn't come to the state, which uh, which, of course, McAuliffe was desperately hoping he would. Um but uh, but he was able to uh, he was able to thread that needle, appeal to the um, to the moderate suburbanites and also bring out uh, the actually the the rural and uh, the rural Trump voters brought themselves out. You know, they they are really just did. yeah, they're just they're just dying for a rematch, uh, you know, for their for their fallen hero. And in fact, a lot of people at Yunkin rallies were there in Trump clothing and paraphernalia and carrying pictures of of their hero. Yeah, fantastic. OK, let me read you an email in, in, in my newsletter this morning. I publish an email from one of our readers uh, named Christopher uh, from Ashburn, Virginia. Do you know where Ashburn is? I'm, I'm not yes. Sure OK, so he says, look, uh, I want to explain something that I am one of these people that seems kind of invisible. Uh, I voted for Joe Biden a year ago, but I also voted for Youngkin. And then he, he goes through and he, he outlines three major issues. I mean, number one. That last year, the issue was Trump, not a rejection of traditional Republican policies. So we we kind of understand that person, you know, voted for Republican candidates, but he just wasn't going to vote for Trump. So it was a specifically anti-Trump vote. And then his number two argument, reason for saying that he voted for Biden a year ago and Youngkin now, is the last four years, the Democratic governance in Virginia has been a a, a mess. And for people outside, I mean, he says, let's start with you know, Northam's medical school blackface yearbook. No mm -hmm. Republican candidate could ever have uh, survived it. Northam showed a Trumpian level of shamelessness in his denials. Um, and, you know, McAuliffe, you know, just embraced Northam, memory hold the whole scandal, and then accused Yunkin of being the dog whistling racist. So one of the reasons that that argument, he would say, didn't work is, well, OK, but what about the white Democratic governor of Virginia that everybody was OK with? 
And then we goes back to, you know, the 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 school issue with the COVID school shutdown and the push for equity over equality for competitive school admissions. Uh, this became real issues, angered many of us living in high cost, high tax D.C. suburbs in Virginia, such as Loudoun and Fairfax counties. And he mentions exactly what you mentioned, what was going on with Thomas Jefferson High School changing its admission standards. So that's his second reason. And then his third reason is that he said that Youngkin's not perfect, but he's not Trump. McAuliffe maintains all the sleaze factor of 90s era Bill Clinton, but without the charm or political skill. His campaign was entirely negative, and he tried to nationalize the local campaign. Trump was not on the ballot, but McAuliffe acted like the former guy was running against him. And lastly, Youngkin was just more likable than McAuliffe. So your, your, your thoughts on that? Because, I mean, I yep. think this, this, is, this is important context here. And also the ability of voters, willingness of voters to say, all right, I'm anti-Trump, but you're not Trump. And, uh, and, and, th and therefore, I'm going to separate you out, which would be good news for Republicans down ballot next year, I would assume. Yeah. And there's another thing that your correspondent reveals that I hope people pay attention to again. And that is, you know, one of the other lessons that we keep hearing is that all poli you remember the uh, Tip O'Neill line, all politics is local. And then everyone said, no, no, that's been flipped on its head. All politics is national now. Well, no, actually, um, not all politics is national. That's what McAuliffe was trying to do, to say that this is a, a, a referendum on, on Donald Trump again and so on. And, uh, and in fact, local issues did matter. I mean, your, your, your letter writer didn't mention the mess of what's going on in D.C. and the fights that the Democrats are right. having in Afghanistan and their failure, sort of the national climate and their failure to give an impression of competent governance right now. That's got to play in as well, I suspect. But um, but no, these local issues still matter. And when you know, he also did not mention, but could have, that not only did Ralph Northam have a scandal, but the but the uh, lieutenant governor right. also had a scandal. A uh, Democratic lieutenant governor. Again, apologize for the noise yeah. here. Um, and uh, so yeah, it uh, the the way you govern matters and. Running, you know, McAuliffe had no platform of his own. He was simply, his entire campaign was, Yunkin is Trump. That's it. That was his really? whole campaign. Well, yeah. and also, I mean, he's a retread. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, he's a retread who turned out to be a very uninspiring candidate. And it's interesting that this writer did mention that he's basically a throwback to the Clinton era. And right. the, the, the notion that Democrats can put up retreads in this particular era, I, I, I think, um, needs to be, shall we say, um, interrogated. It not yeah. a great idea, yeah. uh, especially if you want to run as a fresh face, forward looking. Um, so speaking of this national environment, there's going to be a lot of uh, finger pointing on Capitol Hill about the the um, the murder suicide pact, or if you prefer, the uh, circular firing squad that has resulted in nothing getting done on the spending packages. Do you think that the results will shock uh, Democrats in Congress out of this um, circular firing squad that they're in? Charlie, I don't know. I, I mean, know the, no. the uh, Abigail Spanbergers and Connor Lambs and Mikey Sherrills have been saying this. I mean, they have been shouting that they need to, uh, that we don't want to hear ever again about defund the police and uh, we need to, you know, we need to be more uh, acceptable to the broad middle. Uh, whether they will get the message, I don't know. But uh, but if they don't, it will. And and even even further, I'm going to now repeat. Yeah. Uh, obviously, our, our live stream from last night is still very much on my mind. And what Sarah Longwell said, I think, also deserves to be emphasized. Tim also made great points. <laughs> yeah. But Sarah said, um, you know, that the, the Democrats you know, seem to think, all right, well, they're fighting over all this. Actually, she didn't say this part, but I'll say it. They're fighting now. It looks bad. Once they get the thing passed, everybody will forget how the sausage was made and they'll right, all be right. happy with it. Right. And, and, but what she said was, look, they think they can solve their problems with this huge tranche of spending. And it is not at all clear that that's true. I don't think uh, it was at all clear. No, no. I mean, I, I agreed. It's not, it's not the case at all. And uh, so. No, I mean, it, it, they, they are not going to solve these problems by passing these spending bills if they do not figure out how to talk to these voters who will determine the outcome of elections for the next decade. If yes. they, if they don't, 
understand how these things play, then it's not going to make any difference. I mean, this has got to be very, very frustrating for them. Um, but again, maybe a wake up call that, uh, you know, you, you know, people are getting $300 checks in their in their bank account every single month and it's not registering. I mean, it's yeah, just, it's exactly, not. And, exactly. and, and the notion, well, if we give out free eyeglasses, that'll register. Look, I mean, not everything they're doing is bad. I want to make it clear. I actually kind of like, I, you and I may disagree about this. I actually like the, the compromise they've come up with about uh, holding drug prices down because I think drug prices are insane and maybe that's going to play, but I just have a sense that they're talking past the voters right now that, you know, you mentioned the McCall not talking about inflation. Folks, you have to talk about inflation. You have to talk about the supply chain. You have to understand that that in the real world, you know, pe- people do not know what's in the in the in the build back better bill. They do not have any idea, but they know what their grocery bill is and they know how much a gallon of gas costs. And this is like, guys, you need to step out of the seminar rooms and understand, talk to real people. And because real people at the PTA meetings and the soccer games are not talking about intersectionality. They're not talking about, you know, they're, they're not talking about the use of pronouns. They're not talking about these, these arcane sorts of, of issues. Um, and you're not speaking to them. Or if they are talking about pronouns and these more arcane, arcane kinds of issues, they're not talking about it in a way that Democrats will benefit from. And, uh, but yeah, the inflation thing, look, uh, you know, Joe Biden said, he would not raise taxes on anybody earning less than $400,000 a year. But inflation is a tax. And not only is it a tax, it's a regressive tax because when gasoline goes up by a dollar a gallon, everybody pays it, but it hurts the poor and the working class more than it hurts wealthier people, right? I mean, because they can afford it. So inflation is a, an insidious tax. It can undermine any government and I mean, I'm not saying that we're in danger of hyperinflation or anything in this country, but it does undermine, you know, maintaining the integrity of the currency is kind of the one of the main Hunter, functions of a government. Yeah, of a government. OK, so let's switch gears here. I think our okay. listeners need to understand that that Mona Charon has spent much of the last week in deep shit. <laughs> This is true. And, and th- this is why I admire you so much, Mona, because for people who don't know, your basement was flooded with raw sewage multiple times, which is like the worst homeowner thing ever. Right. I mean, it, it is. And and the other day we were having um, a conversation. You said, you know, I'm not going to be able to have my column because, of course, my basement's full of shit. And I just I can't I, I can't deal with that. And yet, because you are such a pro, you wrote a column that's in the bulwark today. And and it talks about your basement full of shit. But then you make this larger point about, you know, why can't, you know, what, what basically the social media art of the country, what a block sewer line is to my basement. So you not only managed to write the column, <laughs> you were able to use your horrible experience as material. But then because you're Mona Charon, hmm. you, you make the bigger, more profound point that having spent... The spent the week in deep shit. It made you think about the state of our culture and our politics. Is this a fair summary? <laughs> well, thank you. It's very kind. Um, <laughs> this did happen. And yeah, the county sewers, it happened to a neighbor too. Um, the most amazing part that I, I describe in the column is I, you know, when I realized what was happening and we finally got a truck to come out from the sewer service to, to try to make the damn thing stop. Because it went on for hours, Charlie. Hours. Oh, what I can't even imagine. I mean, you know, just uh, anyway. So I ran to my neighbor who was just pulling into her driveway, and I said, "You need to check your basement." And she just stared at me because I, you know, explained. Yeah. And she stared at me, and I, and I said, "I said, I think you might want to check your basement." And she said, "I heard you." She said, "I'm just terrified." Yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, she has the same issue. So yeah, I mean, you know, so, so Did you have a lot of stuff of down people, there. I mean, I, 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 I I'm in the no, basement, my Charlie. office is down here and I, I got to tell you that if this happened, it would be just so, so catastrophic. Oh, so you Charlie, did it. You, yeah, you did. did, huh? we did. It was a finished uh, basement. Oh, it had rugs, it had oh, sofa, no. it had, you know, an ottoman, it had 
books on the shelves along the floor, you know, floor to ceiling books. Uh, it was and nice. Bottom shelf is completely gone. We, yeah, I mean, just so Clo- much. Clor- Clorox doesn't fix that. No, and um, that right now, it, I don't know if you can hear it, but right now they're tearing out the drywall. Yep. Um. Anyway, it's um. But my reflections on this were, look, I mean, you know, a lot of people were very nice and and that's great and, you know, much appreciated, truly. But, you know, some people on Twitter, okay, on Twitter, right? Uh, right? In the midst of this emergency, it was a Saturday morning. I was trying to get, you know, the county to respond. Right. At first, it was difficult. I couldn't reach anybody. You call plumbers and you get, you know, it's weekend, you know, leave a message. We'll get back to, you know. Meanwhile, the you know what is like burbling out of yeah. drains and and out of toilets, you know, overflowing out of toilets in our basement. And so in my, you know, before I had heard back from Arlington County, I, I decided I'll just tweet something. Sure. Maybe somebody help, from Arlington help. County is, you know, <laughs> is going to be on Twitter and we'll notice. And so, of course, this was an invitation for the jackasses on Twitter to make, you know, cruel and 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 pointless comments about you deserve this. God, this is God what you might get have, for- Yes, here's one. God yeah. might have sent it in response to your endorsing candidacies of communists. Yeah, there you go. Karma is a bitch, eh? Pretend it's what used to be your political values getting revenge for your embrace of Democrats, said another. Right. Who I'm sure yeah. is a nice person, right? I mean, oh yes, very nice. Somebody's somebody's grandma. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I got a lot of you know. Why don't you and your friends have your friends from the Lincoln Project help you out? Now it what? drives me nuts that people always think uh, that the bulwark is the Lincoln Project. You know, mm-hmm. we are not. But anyway, the fact is, when someone is having a crisis, you don't dance on their grave. You don't make them feel worse. Okay. That's kind of a basic thing. I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. And I'd cite in the column, the fact that, you know, during the campaign, it was August, Donald Trump's brother died and Jill and Joe Biden extended their sympathies. They put out a statement, just the basics that any decent human being does so sorry for your loss. You know, we know the importance of family and so on and so forth. And, you know, that used to be just the bare minimum that, that civilized people did for one another. And in the, in the completely vertiginous descent of the last six years uh, into cruelty and coarseness and raw, disgusting behavior, kind of like the way my basement looks, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that seemed unusual by, by Biden it did. and I it, appreciated it, seems, yeah, it yeah. you know, and, and it was surprising, so, but it ought not to have been surprising. It ought not to have been. And that's the thing. It's just, you know, uh, these, these people have, people have just discarded basic human decency in their embrace of of uh, of political hatreds and it is just mystifying to me are, are we showing our age though by having this conversation because i wonder whether there are people who are kind of rolling their eyes and thinking well of course this has been going on all of my life that when someone dies or has a tragedy you do dump on them or you expect to have people dump on them you know i mean i i actually still remember a long long time ago when i first got involved in, ra- in radio which was very very intense the first time I began to think, you know, honestly, there are people who, if I died or was killed, would be happy about it, would celebrate it. And I remember being shocked by it for a little while until I got used to it. Um, and now it's like routine. But but I mean, that's that's how far we've come that at one point it was surprising. Now it's almost a reflex. You have entire media worlds that that kind of thrive on you know, jabbing people when they're, when they're down. Yeah. Look, uh, whenever you read history, um, you know, you find horrible examples of, of depraved human conduct. That's just part of the human condition. Um, but I do think that there has, there's no denying that there has been a marked decline in civility and decency in our public life 
in the last few years in this country. It, there's just no doubt. I mean, we all remember a time when, you know, when when uh, there was a, a death, for example, in a, of a figure in, a, in one of the political parties. There would be speeches from both sides of the aisle praising this person and saying, well, we didn't always agree, but he was a fine person or she was a great representative and she did what she thought was right. You know, that was just the way things were not so long ago. I'm not imagining this, right, Charlie? No, no, you're not. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> but, but, but I understand why you ask that, you know, did, <laughs> did we just miss it or maybe it was going <sighs> on below the surface? Um, we just didn't have the ability to be as awful to one another uh, Listen, as we are when, now. I mean, I, it was harder to I, be awful to one another at one time, right? Yeah. Well, I'll, t- I'll t- t- tell you a quick little story. When I was my first job out of college, I went to work at National Review Magazine, right? And um, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I was a lowly, you know, editorial assistant. And one of my jobs was to um, collate and produce the letters section for each magazine. And, uh, and, and some of the letters were from crazed people of various sorts, you know, who believed that, uh, that, that, that the water supply was, was being manipulated by the communists and whatever. And, and, um, and so it was a matter of joking, right. Uh, uh, on the staff. Of, oh, Mona, tell us what kind of crazy letters we got this week, you know? And of course they were never published. They were never dignified. They were never responded to. Right. Um, flash forward. I worked for Pat Buchanan in the white house and I was helping him answer some of his mail. This was in the Reagan years. Oh, but and that he was would fun. get a lot of he would, it was actually. <laughs> he would get a lot of letters from anti Semites. This was before mm-hmm. Pat Buchanan kind of became one. But he said, um, Mona, don't answer the anti Semites. Mm. Um mm. and um and then, you know, you get to twenty sixteen and beyond, and you have places, right wing outlets, not I not either of the ones that I just mentioned, but you have right wing outlets that are publishing all those letters and are publishing articles by the kinds of people who wrote those letters. <laughs> well, and you and you have some of the the same language being used by the man who's the president of the United States. The, of, yeah. of, all, of all the things that have been hard to deal with, it is exactly what you're describing here, that you've always known that there were crazy people out there, but to watch the sort of Overton window of what's acceptable discourse move so that things that would have been you know, absolutely not allowed in any sort of respectable publication are now just right. all over the place. I mean, they're they're, yep. they're 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 just part of they're part of the discourse. I mean, you, you hear things coming out of the mouths of United States senators that you know you would have expected from the mouth of the you know the, the the drunken old guy at the end of the bar, and this is where we're at. It's almost like the sewage is coming up from the basement. I see. This is the great thing: the metaphor <laughs> alert. You took a personal <laughs> tragedy and turned it into this important <laughs> metaphor. You know, meta, <laughs> metaphor alert. You know. You know, the basement is just filling. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm really sorry. So you're going to have to burn the whole house, aren't you? Oh, you're going to have to move. I, I, no, I know that JVL I'm... suggested that on one of our <laughs> conversations earlier the week. The Mona, you're going to have to move now, right? So. Oh gosh, I d- I will confess that after the first night I worked, which we spent in a hotel, of course, um, I did say to my husband, "I think we have to move," and and he was adamant that that wasn't happening. So we're just going to have to fix it. Um, and uh, and make sure that we uh, lean on the county. We we actually had a little. Ca- Most of the people from Arlington County have been great, mm-hmm. but we did get one letter from the so-called ombudsman. Basically, no sympathy, no you know. Oh, you know, we're you know we're going to be sending someone out to examine the situation, make sure this never happens again. And here's a list of vendors that we found yeah. can be very helpful. Not you know nothing like that. No, they said. Under section blah blah blah, we're not responsible for anything that happened. You know, I mean, it was really? just unbelievable. Is, isn't that the job of the ombudsman to try to be helpful? To you to know, think about, yeah, I mean, I, that's that's the the purpose of the you would position, yeah. right? To be yeah. nice. So I have I have some personal news that may have may have some consequences to the listeners of this podcast. Um, l- later this afternoon, I'm getting my third Moderna shot, the booster. Mm-hmm. Yay! Good for you. I, I'm very much looking forward to it. However, my, my my wife has been saying, "So, have you made any plans for if you're like flat on your back tomorrow?" And I said, "No, no, no. I should be fine. I, I should be okay." And so she's been, I guess, we're doing the podcast. She's sending me these direct messages of all the people who are saying, "Yeah, hey, I just got my third Moderna shot, and boy, I felt like a truck hit me, or I felt like I ran a hundred miles, or I am, I, I am, I am down for the count." Now that's worth it for me. I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm not spreading. 
any sort yeah. of skepticism because right. I, actually having a reaction like that shows that your immune system is working. So it is, it in fact is good news. And I'm very much looking forward to this because I'm very much looking forward to traveling um, internationally, you know, later this, Ooh, late, later oh, this year. Great. And so I, I want to, I want to max out, but I'm mentioning this just in case I, I sound maybe a little bit less, shall we say high energy on, tom <laughs> on tomorrow's <laughs> podcast. I'm not going to cancel or reschedule the podcast. I'm I'm going to, I'm going to go through it, but I'm just, I'm just putting up the flag that it might be whoever the guest is say, Hey, you, could you just talk for 40 minutes? Because I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to sit here <laughs> well, and, and drink, drink herbal recall, tea. If I recall correctly, Charlie, you had a pretty dramatic reaction to number two shot, right? Right, you, right. Yeah. I was, I, 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 I was out. It wasn't that bad. See, it, for people were worried about it. I mean, it was, it was like for about 12 hours. And the thing about it was, you know, you're down and then it just goes away. I know. Which is like, unlike most unlike times. Unlike COVID. Right. <laughs> Or the flu, when you get the flu and you, you get yeah. better and you're still like a week later, you're still feeling kind of crappy and you're kind right. of low powered and everything. No, this was like, it was like seven o'clock at night and it was like, it's gone. I'm fine. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That's so, terrific. Anyway, so that's well, what I got. good luck with that. We should also yeah. mention, Charlie, we that should, for Bulwark Plus members, we're going to be starting, you and I, a secret podcast that we're going to do once a week. That will be a members only deal. Um, so we hope people will sign right up and join us. Yeah. So Bulwark Plus members have access to the secret podcast, which is Sarah Longwell and JVL and the next level podcast, which they, they, they bring in Tim Miller. So our podcast is going to be the next, next level, right? <laughs> or will, will it be the, the grownups are in the house level? There you go. Right? You, you and I. <laughs> And we're going to be doing that. If you sign up for Bulwark Plus, you will have access to that as well, which will be even more, shall we say, unconstrained. We'll actually be yeah. able to use words in that podcast that we wouldn't use <laughs> in this podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't get through this. Hey, uh, Mona, thanks, thanks for coming on today. I appreciate it very much. My pleasure. Take care, Charlie. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow. And... God willing, and the sewage doesn't rise, we'll do this all over again. <laughs>